Hello, everyone, and welcome to Illinois Humanities' latest installation of Envisioning Justice Rapid Response Series. Uh, tonight's theme is reentry. My name is Tyrese Williams, and I'm the program manager for Envisioning Justice at Illinois Humanities. And hello, everyone. I'm Jane Beachy. I'm the artistic director of Illinois Humanities, which activates the humanities through free public programs, grants, and educational opportunities that foster reflection, spark conversation, build community, and strengthen civic engagement. And I'm Dominique Stewart, a guest curator for tonight and a longtime partner for Illinois Humanities Envisioning Justice Initiative, which leverages the arts and humanities to envision alternatives to the enduring injustice of mass incarceration. Uh, we're so happy to have you here with us, Dominique. And yes. <laughs> yes, we are. And I have to give a fun fact, which is that uh, so Dominique has been a long, long time partner of Envisioning Justice, but also this trio of people that you see on your screen right now traveled together to New York City for the Beyond the Bars conference in March 2020, leading me to have some of probably the only <laughs> known conference paraphernalia from 2020 in existence. Uh, and the pandemic was closing down upon us as we flew back to Chicago and it was a delightful trip and we've only seen each other on Zoom screens since then. <laughs> but it's so good to be here with you anyway, Dominique and Tyrese. What a joy. Likewise, <laughs> likewise. Yes, so, so, so good to be here. Um, and yeah, and thank you for that trip down memory lane, Jane. <laughs> so, <laughs> but yeah, uh, so if you want to learn more about Illinois Humanities and Envisioning Justice, you can go to at ilhumanities.org or find us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, or LinkedIn at ilhumanities, hashtag Envisioning Justice. Um, a huge thanks to the multi-talented Tony Santiago, who is our streaming producer tonight and whose video editing skills are making this program possible. Uh, thank you so much, Tony. Yes, thanks, Tony. Now let's get into tonight's program, the theme for which, as Tyrese said, is re-entry. This evening's videos will share the perspectives of formerly incarcerated individuals and advocates working to create more affirming spaces for returning citizens after incarceration in Illinois and re-examine existing approaches to accountability. And after that, We'll enjoy a DJ set from the one and only DJ L. O. Kari. So stick around. We posed a few questions for our contributors to consider as they created their videos for tonight's program. What are some common experiences and perspectives shared by formerly incarcerated individuals? How can the arts and humanities support individuals as they return to their communities after incarceration? How can we transform our society to welcome and support people who are returning to their communities from jail or prison? And what reentry support efforts already exist in Illinois and how can they be reimagined? Yes, uh, and so we hope tonight's contributions will increase your understanding and awareness around reentry. We also hope you'll be inspired to continue this exploration with us next week, July 21st at the same time, 7 p.m. Central, for a live conversation where I will be having a conversation with renowned voting rights activist, Desmond Mead. Um, his recently published book, Let My People Vote, My Battle to Restore the Civil Rights of Returning Citizens, uh, chronicles Mead's life, his political activism, and the successful voting rights movement he has spearheaded through the Florida Rights Restoration Coalition. It's gonna be a really wonderful conversation and I'm so excited for it. But before we get to all of that, Let's get started with tonight's contributions. Yes, I, so I'm very excited to introduce our first contributors of the night. It's from a, a wonderful duo. Um, Orlando Mayorga is the new policy coordinator for the Office of the Illinois Lieutenant Governor's Justice, Equity and Opportunity Initiative and former director of free entry programs at Precious Blood Ministry of Reconciliation. And Joseph Mapp is a restorative justice practitioner who is passionate about ending mass incarceration. Um, as a returning citizen who is still impacted by the justice system, he is driven to end permanent punishment. He works as the program manager and director of reentry for Precious Blood Ministry of Reconciliation in the back of the yards community in Chicago. Welcome to the first episode of Jojo and Chili's Reentry Podcast. We're here today again to talk about reentry, 
Uh, my name is Orlando Mayorga. I am a member of the People's Liberty Project, and we're an initiative of formerly incarcerated people, our families, and our children, uh, hoping to not only affect policy change, but also to provide collaborative healing for one another due to the trauma caused by mass incarceration. And my name is Joseph Mapp. I'm a member of the People's Liberty Project as well. Also, I'm the Director of Reentry at Precious Blood Ministries of Reconciliation, where we provide direct services to our communities and communities across the city. Thank you for your service, Jojo. We're going to get right to it. Uh, what are some common experiences and perspectives shared by formerly incarcerated people you've encountered, Jojo? So, some common experiences is the uh, running up against the barriers of employment and a sustainable living, and also uh, butting up against stigmatizations of having a criminal background. Absolutely. And, and to ask you a question, Shelly, how can we transform this society to better address these needs so for the individuals returning won't have to face this so much? I think understanding that at the end of the day, we're human beings. Uh, we're mothers, we're fathers, we're brothers, we're sisters, uh, we're sons and daughters. And I think people need to understand that we're not ex-cons, we're not cons, we're not criminals, we're not ex-criminals, we're people. Uh, chipping away at that language issue, I think, is one way to do it. Uh, but also understanding that we need opportunities. We need to be, again, looked at through that human lens and not be discriminated against based on our background. Good point. So this last question, what reentry efforts already exist in Illinois, Jojo? And also, how can they be reimagined? So already there's a lot of services being provided by community-based organizations such as case management, accompaniment, and engaging in different systems that uh, may have the keys to access to these different services. But how they can be reimagined, if you take one, we mentioned housing. If housing can move from being transitional, which is something that's being provided now to more permanent base, they give individuals the opportunity to call something their own as well as creating opportunities for sustainable income and living wages. What do you think, Chilly? I'm, I'm directly in line with what you're saying. I understand that Precious Blood is actually uh, engaging in first-time homeownership for formerly incarcerated people, and that's what we mean by reimagining. Uh, understanding that it's not just the short-term, uh, it's not the preventative work, uh, but it's also the long-term work and the sustainable work that's necessary for our communities. Uh, one thing that I would like to chime in on is the change that we need in the criminal legal system process. Uh, it's based on punishment. It's based on not including the voices of those directly impacted, uh, whether it be the families uh, that have been harmed or whether it's been the person or the people that have caused the harm. There needs to be a more restorative approach to that. And I think we could do that. I think we're moving towards that to be able to be more restorative uh, when it comes to the criminal legal system and, and, and empower people. Uh, to engage in that process instead of having the judge speak uh, for society, instead of having the public defender or the private attorney speaking for the family uh, or the defendant, and for the state's attorney to be uh, speaking for the harmed or the harmed uh, person's family. Uh, we need that kind of change. We need that transformative change in not only our criminal legal system, but also in our communities. Uh, building up community capacity, not being so reliant and, and, and burdening uh, the, the, the police. Uh, there are a lot of issues in our community that can be taken care of by people in the community. And I think, again, Precious Blood and some communities uh, like Back of the Yards are taking a, a big initiative and, and taking a, more of that power and, and, and relying on the people in the community to, to be the people that uh, can change uh, the way we do things. Can you, uh, in this closing, can you speak to some of our allies who actually support this work? Absolutely. Uh, shout out to the Fully Free campaign. Uh, it's an uh, initiative in Illinois and across the nation engaging formerly incarcerated people and our families uh, to come together and create uh, a power base a power base of voters uh, to see the policy, policy changes we want to see not only in Illinois but again uh, across the country. Shout out also to the All of Us Are None campaign, the national campaign that we are all aligned with hoping to see this national movement, this national campaign uh, of, of not excluding people that have convictions or that have been impacted by mass incarceration. What about you, Jojo? Thank you. I would like to shout out Chicago Votes. This is an organization that strives to affect policy and legislation that is affecting many justice-impacted people. Thank you for your work and many other organizations that 
do the work behind the scenes that's not being named right now. We appreciate you and we see you. Absolutely. And again, we definitely don't want to um, miss out on those providing direct services. Uh, shout out to cp for p Shout out to the Restorative Justice Hubs. The work that is being done to uh, restore and to create balance uh, in, in fractured relationships is definitely the work that is needed. People need resources and organizations like Precious Blood, like New Life, like Target Area Development Corps are doing the great work on the boots, on the ground. Uh, also, shout out to the outreach workers, uh, the first line of defense when it comes to this violence prevention work. Thank you so much for your service. Uh, we could not do what we do in this policy space uh, in partnership and in collaboration with you all. Thank you very much. Y'all have a blessed day. Thank you all. Uh, thank you so much, Joseph and Orlando. Uh, there was honestly so much information in that video to think about, but I really appreciated Orlando's emphasis on chipping away at the language we use when we speak about returning citizens, but also to look at them through a human lens so that we can see them as more than the crimes they may have committed. Uh, personally for me, uh, that was a crucial first step in becoming a better advocate. That's great, thanks Tyrese. Um, our next guest is LaShawn China Fonza. She's a street outreach and reentry worker in the Austin and North Lawndale community areas, specializing in youth and seniors. She reentered society in 2000 after her incarceration and now supports others in harm reduction, violence prevention, and reentry. She serves as a mentor and a guide and has a never give up attitude when it comes to people with justice system involvement, and she is a masterful networker and an absolute go-getter. Hi, my name is China Fon. My re-entry into society was very, very frustrating, the year of 2000. And at that point in time, there were no female halfway houses. There were only halfway houses for treatment centers. Most of the resources that were distributed only distributed for men. So that made reentry hard for me. But reentry is also about networking, who you know. I was able to change my life around within a three year span. I started school, I started giving back, and today I am a full fledged social worker that helps with juveniles. I prefer to work with the juveniles because myself, that's when it went wrong for me at 13. So I urge any person, when you see it, say something and do something. It's a lot harder than it was when I was a young lady because there's so many kids getting shot. The resources that we need are more treatment centers and more mental health availability without the stigma of being called crazy. There are so many things that our neighborhood can use. But meanwhile, we are working in the trenches trying to get our neighborhood back together. As a community outreach worker, I do a lot of things with juveniles as well as seniors because that's, the, that's our beginning and our end. We all start as a child, but we all have to get older and we start teaching our children now. We have a better community when we're older because it's hard to watch these kids die so easily and rapidly. I pray and I work to make a better day. Thanks so much, China. I so appreciate what you said about it's important to focus from young people all the way to seniors, knowing that we need to focus on our beginning and our ends in community. We need to make sure that our young people are supported no matter what mistakes they make and are walked through their entire lives throughout their senior years and to ensure that our, our seniors aren't um, isolated and they still know that the community cares about them, no matter what mistakes have been made, no matter how much time has, has been served. So really appreciate you sharing um, your experiences. Yes, I echo that. And um, thank you, Dominique. And thank you so much, China. Um, I've had the incredible good fortune through Envisioning Justice to um, get to see you in action a little bit and, and can attest to um, all that all that Dominique says and all that your bio says. Um, you're a really powerful advocate and go-getter. And so thank you very much. Um, so I get to introduce our next contributor, Anthony Sims. 
Um, Anthony is a Chicago-based multidisciplinary artist. As a Black queer person who identifies as non-binary, they create work at the intersections of race, gender, class, and sexuality. Their work has been seen at the Museum of Contemporary Art of Chicago, the Peace Studio, Lynx Hall, Co-Prosperity Sphere, Roots and Culture, and several other locations. They also have a book that will be published through the Center for Afrofuturist Studies this fall. Please enjoy this video from Anthony Sims. Thank you so much, Anthony, for that incredibly compelling video. Um, Anthony gave us a quote actually to consider um, as we reflect upon this video and it's by Orison Sweat Martin. It says, a good system shortens the road to the goal. And Anthony also said, this performance piece gives a bird's eye view of a puzzle. Influences try to guide the directions for the performer. 
Sometimes those influences try to steer us into a direction where there is no exit. The power to escape the mold becomes mental and physical. And I so appreciate that because my first response in watching this video was to think about the military and militarization, left, 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 right, left. Um, and then that made me think about certain school environments um, that, I, that I have seen where students are, where it is almost kind of militaristic, the way that students are told how to line up and walk over here and sit over there and all these um, instructions that are kind of meant to like strip autonomy and individuality. So I just love and appreciate this potent imagery that helps us recognize the mental um, strength that it takes to actually break out of a structure and a system that is meant to keep you um, small and keep you confined. So thank you, Anthony. Yeah, uh, thank you so much, Jane. And I think that that's relatable for all of us. I mean, we all are kind of doing our best and we'll be being pushed in all of these different directions. And sometimes it feels like an endless loop. Um, but to add uh, re-entering on top of that is, you know, just another compounding variable that makes things so difficult for folks. So yeah, thank you for, for highlighting that. Uh, and so, yeah, I think I'll, I'll go into our next contributor. Uh, and our next contributor's name is Heather Canwell. Um, and Heather is actually currently an Envisioning Justice grantee partner uh, in Bloomington, Illinois. Um, Heather is also an activist whose work is linked to and fueled by her experiences with incarceration. Um, she's an organizer for the Women's Justice Institute and Heather provides hairstyling services to currently and formerly incarcerated people alongside her own work in the arts and humanities. Um, so here's a few words from Heather Canwell. Hello, everybody. My name is Heather Canuel, and I am the Downstate Organizer for WJI. I am also the founder of Art from the Heart, a non-for-profit that helps children reunite with their loved ones of incarceration. Today, I'm here to talk about reentry. There are quite a few facets to reentry that are overlooked that could really help our men and women in Illinois to be successful in their journey. Illinois Humanities does a great job of helping people with successful reentry by the programs, the grants, the way that they network with their communities. And I believe these are models that should be taken to other communities like in downstate Illinois. Um, there are certain facets to reentry that are overlooked, as I said, such as simple things like personal hygiene. Uh, men and women upon release sometimes don't have that interview outfit or they don't have um, mascara or money for a haircut to make themselves feel good upon that interview time. And I'm a firm believer that self-worth is built with self-esteem and we feel better when we look better. There are four things I want to talk about about reentry that I feel are most important for women because I do feel like a woman is like a pie. P I E S. Physical, intellectual, emotional, and social. There are quite a few ingredients that will make us a successful member of society upon reentry. Physically, you want to be fit enough to be able to walk to that interview or be able to walk to and from work and not have to rely on anybody. Uh, that would help with successful reentry as well. Intellectually, you have to be able to fill out that application to use your interview skills and give callbacks. Intellectually is a huge piece of the pie for successful reentry as well. Some men and women have been gone eight, 10, 12 years. They've never seen a MacBook. The last technology they may have seen is a typewriter. So intellectually, to be able to broaden uh, intellect to offer more opportunities is great for successful reentry as well. Emotionally, emotionally, it's a huge part of the pie because you're going to have to deal with rejection. It's inevitable. One out of 10 interviews, you may get a yes, but you are going to get no's. Unfortunately, people are judged upon our mistakes 10, 20 years ago, but emotionally, if you're stable enough to know that it's not really you, it's 
them and there's something better for you, then emotionally you'll be able to deal with that rejection and be able to be successful. And the last ingredient to the pie is the social aspect. The social aspect is super important for cutting recidivism rate and building support systems. Socially, you have to cut ties with the people that you hung out with before that may have gotten you in trouble. You may have to build a new network, a new social circle, but they're all positive people and you can recreate your life and your daily habits and your behaviors. So socially, you have to be strong as well and know that you're starting with a blank slate. All of these ingredients to the pies for a woman and a man are ingredients to make for successful reentry. Uh, thank you so much, Heather. Um, that PI acronym not only made me a little hungry, uh, but I also think it's a helpful framework uh, for thinking about the many layers to reentry. Um, while there are so definitely some systemic changes and supports needed, I think you also reminded me that you can support others simply by ensuring that their most basic needs are met. Yes, thank you, Heather, and always so grateful for the ways that you uplift the unique challenges um, and opportunities and, and needs of women who are um, returning from incarceration. So thank you, thank you so much. Um, I get to introduce our next video, which was contributed both by an organization and an individual. Um, to Five Ventures is a national organization that promotes entrepreneurship among incarcerated and formerly incarcerated folks. And Melissa O'Dell, Defy's Illinois Executive Director, connected us with Defy participant Carl Williams to hear a little bit more about what they do. So please enjoy this video from Defy Ventures and Carl Williams. Defy Ventures' mission is to shift mindsets to give people with criminal histories their best shot at a second chance. Our vision is to cut the recidivism rate in half by leveraging entrepreneurship to increase economic opportunity and transform lives. Hello, my name is Carl Williams. Um, I am currently a person who is formerly incarcerated, who has just come home after doing 27, almost 27 years. Um, today, I just wanted to have the opportunity to be able to speak a little bit about myself and being someone who's formerly incarcerated. Uh, coming home from being a person who was formerly incarcerated, I think that one of the things that uh, I had been faced with and that uh, um, others who like me are faced with is preparing yourself and coming to a society that has, in a sense, almost passed you by for the time or the duration that you spent away from the society. So you have to, in coming home, you find yourself um, trying to adapt to everyday life of being free. Most people would think that it should be an easy transition, but you're released from prison with a bus ticket and $50. How do you integrate back into society um, with that, with $50 and a bus ticket, but with no resources? So if you're, if you're lucky enough or blessed enough to be able to have those resources, then maybe there's, there's plenty of opportunity and a blessing for you to be able to do so. But for those who don't, where do they go, what do they do, and where do they begin, as I spoke of in, in the beginning? But once I became a part of the program of the five, I found uh, the, the developments that it offered me when it came to my growth also when it came to my healing, by adding to my education, as well as my communication, and being a resource for me when it comes to um, business, and growing and supporting not just myself, but my family and my community. One of the things that I've enjoyed and that I've loved about the five is the, is the, the, the opportunity adventure. And what I mean by that is having the opportunity to be able to create um, 
a business, also to be able to create um, and use your ideas to not just better yourself, but better your community, community and those who you come into contact with um, every day. One of the things that I always take is how they talk about building business. So I make the connection of building business when it comes to building myself as well. The person that I would want to be and their, and their information was the, 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 the business that you would want to build. So I make those connections from the business that I want to see and the business that I want to build. And I make that in align that with myself, the person that I want to be and the business that and, and the person that I will want to continue to build and grow and develop into. Thank you so much, Carl, and thank you so much to Five Ventures. Um, and most of all, welcome home, Carl. We're so glad. Um, we're so glad to know you. We're so glad to be able to share your words tonight. And I so appreciate your emphasis on bettering not just yourself, but also your community and the people you come into contact with every day and your recognition of the ways that individual pursuits impact society as a whole. So much of what I've learned about carceral justice um, over the course of envisioning justice reflects just that. So I really appreciate your perspective. Thanks, Carl. Thanks, Jane. George Wilson is an active member of the North Lawndale community and is passionate about giving back to the area that raised him. George re-entered society in 2012 after his incarceration. And since then, he has dedicated his time, energy, and efforts to working in youth violence prevention and street outreach. George currently volunteers for Gateway Foundation and works at Sinai Community Institute conducting COVID-19 vaccine education and outreach. When I returned from jail, it was kind of like um, real scary. When I returned back to society, it's because I knew uh, a few things. Uh, I didn't have no work history and I lacked the education to work as well. Naturally, I didn't have any money. So I know it costs to live out here. You got to be able to provide for yourself. So I tried some of the, the local resources, places like uh, public aid, uh, getting the link card, getting health insurance, which was kind of like challenging because if you don't have the appropriate documents, which I failed, neglected to have, like uh, something simple as a social security card in the state ID, it's kind of like troubling. So one of the individuals that I met while I was incarcerated was an individual that belonged to a drug program called Narcotics Anonymous. So he used to always tell me, he say, George, man, uh, if you can learn how to get out and stay away from drugs, man, uh, you know, uh, things will open up for you, endless possibilities. And I used to always say, well, man, I don't have a place to stay. I don't have a job. He said, look, man, don't worry about that. He said, I tell you what, if you can get out and you don't get high the first day of you getting out, I set you up to a place where you probably can start, you know what I'm saying, getting housed and they can also put you in a job training program. So that, that friend stuck to his promise and I stuck to mass, which I didn't use drugs my first day of, uh, being returned to society, and he put me in like a um, like a halfway house, I want to say. So I was transformed to this place called Gateway Halfway House, and it was for those individuals that's uh, that trying to stay out for drugs. So that was my first priority to, to remain drug free. So upon remaining drug free, I say for like 28 days, an individual had told me, man. Uh, uh, you got drug free, you can pass a drop, man. Uh, I got some work for you, man, if you can continue to pass a drop. So he turned me on to this day labor program where I had to take a urinalysis drop and stay drug free, uh, helped me get my uh, ID and social security card. I had went to the public uh, aid office and got a, a link card so I could provide pay for food while I was in the shelter as well. But I still had always had in the back of my mind I knew my past would catch up with me and, and kind of like deterred me from having a, a better future. So 
I think it's very important for guys like myself to tell their story, to let other guys that's like myself, formerly incarcerated or that's about to return to society, to know that it is chance, it is thing, this thing called hope. Who's best to tell a story than someone that's been in their shoes? George, thank you so much for sharing your story. I think oftentimes we don't realize that, you know, sometimes when people commit offenses, they don't even know that something is wrong. It's just their normal. And for your story, you were just following what different people told you because you were looking for a father figure. And I think it's so important for us to realize that there are so many people out there who are just looking for mentors and guides and teachers and following their past. And so you giving us that view and that insight helps us to develop compassion for those who have gotten, ca gotten caught up in, in the justice system and made mistakes and then come back to their communities um, seeking a better opportunity. Yes, uh, thank you so much, Dominique. I, I think it's so important for us to continue to build that muscle of compassion and empathy for folks. Um, and that's something that George has always extended to me in all the many times I've been in space with him. Uh, he actually was at my very first envisioning justice program I ever worked. Um, and he was a pleasure to, to, to be in conversation with. Um, so thank you, George. And so yeah, I'm gonna introduce our next contributor uh, for, for tonight's program. Um, and, and her name is Takunzi Green. And uh, Takunzi was actually introduced to us by our grantee partner, Illinois Coalition for Higher Education in Prison. Uh, so thank you, uh, Ilcha. And Takunzi is a community educator and ambassador for the Illinois Prison Project. She serves on the Survivor Advisory Council for Defending Self-Defense Initiative of Surviving Punished. And she's also a proud mother of one son. So yeah, I'll, I'll hand it over to, to Kinsey to take it away. The criminal system and the larger community need to create avenues for people in prison to transition back to the community to be successful and productive. People need information and program opportunity long before they are released. Planning must include long-term as well as people serving short sentences, but the prison only provide programs for people about to be released. There's not a strong understanding of what work and doesn't work for people coming home. And there's a 50-50 chance that people go back to prison within a short time. There are some programs, but the question is, do they work to fulfill requirements everyone has upon release? Absolutely not. There's a lack of support from the justice system, especially for women who are re being released. Women's needs are urgent and usually they are the children caregivers. Many women lack support from their own family, even when they need to provide for their children. There's not enough program and information within the prison system to help women get back to normal life without going through the hardship of reuniting their children, getting everything they need to support their children, like finding a job and getting housing. The loss of of freedom and recovering from it causes a person to, to suffer long-term consequences. It's like we are still being punished after being released and don't have much to look forward to. Parolees face the barriers of restriction from certain jobs, getting housed in the system, as well as work skills after incarceration. The collateral consequences of a criminal record hold a lot of people back from moving forward in life as law-abiding citizens. The system needs to completely change to provide people with programs and resources from the beginning of their sentence in, in incarceration, of their incarceration, and to provide quality community programs to people when they come home. 
community members and artists can play a vital role in healing people coming home and advocating, advocating for system change. Uh, a huge thanks uh, to Takunzi for uplifting women's needs for re-entry, more specifically the, the hardships faced by mothers re-entering society after incarceration. Uh, and I also want to shout out uh, Moms United Against Violence and Incarceration for allowing us to use that awesome graphic throughout the video. Thanks Tyrese and thanks to Kunzi. Our next guest, Dr. Adrian Kimia Faulkner, is a licensed clinical psychotherapist who has extensive experience in the health and human services, counseling, and working with youth and adults in both group and individual settings. During her tenure at a residential treatment facility, she realized that a number of black and brown patients were being misdiagnosed by white doctors. This sparked her passion to pursue the field of counseling more intently and work to increase the number of practitioners of color who demonstrate cultural humility and competency, especially to those who need mental health services and build up research on how to effectively serve black and brown clients. She prides herself on a therapeutic approach that centers around educating the patient to self-advocate as well as develop self-confidence and self-efficacy. Hi, my name is Dr. Adrian Camille Faulkner and I'm a licensed clinician. You know, working with the formerly incarcerated, I've learned several different experiences shared, including the inability to feel like I belong, right? the fact that the community does not respect them, does not accept them, and that they haven't forgiven them. That person that was once incarcerated starts to feel rejected and either resort back to what actually got them incarcerated or they're left feeling like nobody cares. I'm a fan of the arts and humanities. For one, I think it teaches incredible critical thinking skills. Um, it allows the person to learn and explore. Um, my favorite is kind of creating your own destiny or co-creating, if you will. Things that are already out in the community that seem to kind of help this specialized population to feel restored and to begin to rebuild includes the restorative justice process. A restorative justice circle includes that of the victim and an offender, along with other community members coming together to kind of address the incident in a very respectful, mutual way. You know, we're all coming from a place of we've been hurt before, we've been let down before, we've experienced grief and loss alike, and that with different exposure and experiences, we may or may not make mistakes that can lead us into the penitentiary. As a clinician, it's important for me to help those unpack the early life traumas associated that got them incarcerated, but most importantly, learn how to start that healing process. So through cognitive behavioral therapy, um, from mindfulness and meditation, they're able to really understand and accept them for who they are now. And again, not for who they once were. Thank you, Dr. A, for sharing the clinical approach as well as the regular everyday approach that anyone can use for restorative justice practice. No matter if you are the offender or the victim, we appreciate that both can come together and restore their relationship and restore and build community. Yes, thank you, Dr. Adrian Faulkner. Thank you, Dominique Stewart. Thank you, Tyrese Williams. And thank you, you people out there in the internet. Thank you for joining Illinois Humanities tonight for Envisioning Justice, Rapid Response, Reentry. We're about to share a link with you to a live set from the phenomenal DJ Elo Kari. But first, if you want to watch this evening's program again or share it with friends, you can do so right here on YouTube using the same link that got you here tonight. Huge thanks to all of our contributors, to our fabulous funders, the Art for Justice Fund, the Mellon Foundation, and the John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation Safety and Justice Challenge. 
Also, a huge thanks to the entire staff of Villanoa Humanities, and again to Tony Santiago for making this all technologically possible. Yes, thank you. And as a reminder, please join us next week, Wednesday, July 21st at 7 p.m. Central Standard Time for Love Will Win the Day, a conversation with Desmond Mead and our one and only Tyrese Williams. In fact, you can stay abreast of all that Illinois Humanities has to offer at ilhumanities.org and at ilhumanities on social media. But first, stick around. We're going to play Shout Across Mountains by Growing Concerns Poetry Collective during the credits, and then be sure to follow the link in the chat to enjoy DJ El Okari's stellar set. Thank you so much for joining Illinois Humanities tonight for Envisioning Justice Back a Response Reentry. Good night. Thank you. Good night. Good night. sound like thunderstorms and glaciers falling we sound like patience in the morning wings of light mixed with heaven yawning glorious scream till we feel victorious my sound teams with the style of the orderless poor profit on soap boxes free soul but the voice had to unlock it uh we disrupt and dismantle we'll take a knee motherfuck your anthem we original never needed a sample my silence speaks as loud as these streets on fire my feet don't tie even when i'm chasing the beat in my mind let it peak in my spine so i keep it aligned all i need is the reason the word and the rhyme boom lost my Myself in the tomb, lost myself to your view, lost myself to the coon, lost what I felt too soon, lost with all of these black bantu, African connections run through no matter if it's only y'all in the room, all greet a homie like ooh, I'm trying to get like you, we loud and we proud cause we full voice people, shout across mountains people, we full voice people, shout across mountains people, we full voice people, shout across mountains people, we full voice people, shout across mountains people. I have tried to fold myself into your quiet places Shoes and laces, I come undone Trying to run into a shape you find acceptable Sometimes it's imperceptible